came to a lost people, ground down by the world in the shadow of an empire. He came to bring hope, life, truth, light. He came and everything changed. Well, good morning, Shoreline Church. Whether you're gathered here in the worship center or someplace else on our campus or joining us online, special welcome on this Palm Sunday 2022. As we think about Palm Sunday, the words that come to mind are words like joy and celebration and jubilation. Those words that also we associate many times with victory parades. And so I want to think back and just look at some, some ideas because we all love a victory parade, don't we? We all love victory parades. Victory parades like this, the Golden State Warriors, June 12th, 2018. Yes, yeah, Steph Curry leading the parade as he's hailed and regaled for winning their third NBA championship in four years. And it would have been four had it not been for LeBron James. How about this one right here? This one from September 3rd of 1936. Yes, that's the great Jesse Owens hailed and welcomed as a hero in New York City after winning four gold medals in the Berlin Olympics. That was the first time any athlete won four gold medals in track and field in a single Olympics. And how about this great moment in history as the Allies liberate Paris? It happened on August 25th. 1944, after four years of German Nazi occupation, Paris is free. Imagine the thousands of perspectives of people that were at all of these events, the joy, the celebration, the jubilation. And so today on Palm Sunday 2022, I want to look back at another monumental moment in history, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's a moment in time that propels us into the week that changed the world. And so today I want to do is I want to look at four unique perspectives of the most amazing victory parade. And to find those perspectives, we're going to actually turn to the Gospels, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because each gospel records this moment in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And that's significant. And also we know that the, the gospels, that each one provides a unique perspective of this moment in history, but it's divinely inspired. Unique perspective, divinely inspired. And so it's beautiful when you read just one of the gospel accounts, but it's even more incredible and impactful and insightful when we read all four of those gospel accounts. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to ask four different readers from the Shoreline family to read for us these gospel accounts. And we're going to begin with perspective number one, which comes to us from Matthew, the gospel of Matthew. And if you remember, Matthew was one of Jesus' disciples. He was a tax collector. He was despised by his own people. He was mistrusted by the Romans. But yet Jesus said, follow me, and called him to his own. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read from Matthew's gospel, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Let's read along. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt beside her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt placed, and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. 
The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth and Galilee. Galilee. Yeah. 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 It's a, a beautiful reading. She must take after her grandmother. If you didn't know, many of you may know that this is our oldest granddaughter, London. Her grandmother happens to be a first grade teacher, so thank you, London, for sharing. What a powerful moment, though, a tender moment for a grandpa to be able to have his granddaughter read God's word this morning. And so as we think about Matthew's account and we look at those words, we hear a couple of uh, uh, geographic locations, and for many of you, you may not be familiar, and so what we've done is we provided a map for you today, and so I want to show you that map, and you'll see in red there, that's the path, that's the road that runs from Jericho up through Bethany, about past Bethphage, over the Mount of Olives, and then down across the Kidron Valley and into Jerusalem. And Jesus will have just come from Jericho, where Jesus is in Jericho, he's healed two blind men. If you go back in Matthew, you read that. It's about a 15-mile journey but just short of Bethphage, which is about two miles from Jerusalem, Jesus will give instructions. Those instructions are to go ahead and find this colt, and then that colt is what Jesus will ride on. And so we think about this distance of two miles Jesus will travel. Jesus normally, and all throughout the Gospels, Jesus always travels by foot. This is the first time in the Gospel accounts where we read of Jesus actually traveling by anything other than foot. And so the question is then is, why did Jesus choose to get on a donkey's colt? Was Jesus tired? Was he fatigued from the journey? He just needed a break to travel those last two miles? No, what we read is that this happened, this took place to fulfill, was spoken through the prophet. And that spoken through the prophet is a reference to Zechariah 9.9, where in that, it's it's a great prophetic announcement of the king, the Messiah, the anointed one, the God of Israel, who is going to return to Jerusalem and make all things right. And he will come righteous and victorious, but he will come gentle and low, riding on the colt of a donkey. And so in this moment, Jesus perfectly fulfills that prophecy, which was spoken through the prophet Zechariah, 500 years earlier, and Jesus perfectly fulfills that. And so we also read in these instructions, we read throughout the account that there's, there's people, and, they're, and they're, uh, they're coming out, and they're, they're singing that song, Hosanna, Hosanna. That, that word, those words right there, it means God saves, salvation has come. So we get this beautiful perspective from Matthew, but we also have another perspective, and that comes from Mark. The Gospel of Mark is our second perspective, and we're going to read that. And Mark is, of course, is very close associates with one of Jesus' closest disciples, which is Peter. And so Mark, in chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, Mark recounts this same historical moment in Jesus' life. Let's read along in Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you doing this, say, the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Amen. Thank you, Zach. It's, and so now in Mark's account, we get more details on this colt, don't we? Jesus is very specific. He says, a colt which no one has ever ridden. 
Now, what's the significance of that? Well, the significance is that there's both really religious and royal reasons why Jesus would want to ride on a unridden or unused colt. And that would be because in religious reasons, these animals would be set apart from birth for a religious purpose, a distinctively religious purpose. And also for royalty, the animals would be set apart so that the king and only the king would ride this animal throughout the animal's entire life. And that animal then, this case, the colt of a donkey would be synonymous with the king who rides it. And so isn't it a beautiful picture that Jesus is offering himself both as the spotless lamb of God and also the king of Israel, the Messiah, comes to Jerusalem riding on this unused and set-apart colt of a donkey. And then notice what Jesus says. If, if someone asks you, it's kind of strange, right? Think about it. The, the, the disciples are going to go up to this and just go find this colt of a donkey, and they're going to untie it, and they're going to take it. And so Jesus sees this, and Jesus says, if someone asks you, you tell them the Lord needs it. See, Jesus is asserting his kingship, but also notice that Jesus didn't say the teacher needs it, the rabbi needs it, or Jesus needs it. What does he say, church? He says, the Lord needs it. I mean, this is God himself. Jesus is declaring that he is the Messiah, God himself. Now, I want you to put yourself in the mind of the owner of the donkey. Someone comes up to you today in your driveway, and there is parked your, your Prius, and they say, hey, we're taking your car because the Lord needs it, right? Now, some of you are like, a Prius, okay, go ahead and take it. But I'll tell you what, with gas prices like they are, you can take the truck, but leave the Prius. <laughs> but just a beautiful picture of Jesus is affirming and asserting his lordship, his kingship. And we also read that there's, people are, are taking their cloaks and they're taking branches from the field and they're laying them out on this path that Jesus is following on the road. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, symbolically, when in that era of history, when you would take your cloak as a king or a royal procession would pass, you then would take your cloak and you would take that cloak off and you would lay it on the ground as an act of submission and loyalty to the king. And also for very practical reasons. The roads were very dusty back then and so the king didn't have to get dust on their feet or in this case, on the donkey's feet. And then also we think about the branches and later we'll learn in John that these are palm branches which is where we get the term Palm Sunday from. But the palm branch itself is symbolic. Palms were the national symbol of Israel. And palms that the, the, Israel, the people of Israel would understand, they're symbolic for celebration and victory. And this then was the people who were saying, the national liberator, the Messiah, the one that is going to overthrow this Roman oppression has come at last. And what do they do? They lay out their cloaks. They lay out these branches. And it's like this two-mile-long red carpet that they've rolled out for Jesus. And we know that they were also singing those songs. Again, Hosanna, God save, salvation is here. And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that is both of those. The second one, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, comes from Psalm 118. And there's a great song of God's victory, a declaration of God saving the people of Israel. And so here on this day, the people are singing these songs and rolling out the red carpet to Jesus. But we know that their songs of praise and their acts of worship were fairly short-lived, weren't they? Because those same people that were singing those songs of praise on Palm Sunday, by week's end, would be yelling what, church? Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. The worship was short-lived. And so we think about that perspective that's offered from Mark. And now we're going to shift to perspective number three, which comes from the Gospel of Luke. And you may recall that Luke was a physician who was a known associate of many of the disciples of Jesus. And so we're going to read from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. Let's read along as we do so. 
After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two, dis two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. <laughs> Just a reminder of the same songs of praise. Luke articulates even further, doesn't he? He gives us some more details. The idea that they were praising God for all the miracles they had seen. They were praising God because Jesus was the miracle worker. He was the, the king that was coming that had performed all these miracles. And then also we see those words that they were singing were peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Glory in the highest. In Latin is gloria in excelsis. Gloria in excelsis. Now where else have we heard those words before? Take you back to Luke 2, verse 14. The angels, the angels have appeared and they're announcing Jesus' birth. And they say this, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And so we have the angels announcing Jesus' arrival at his birth. And now here we have the people announcing Jesus' arrival to Jerusalem. Beautiful reminder and beautiful picture of the kingship, the lordship of Christ. And we also know that at the end of that, we read those words that Jesus tells, the, the, he rebukes the, the uh, Pharisees because the Pharisees are telling Jesus, you need to rebuke your disciples. And why does Jesus say, why does Jesus not correct? The Pharisees are hearing and they're seeing and they're observing what the people are saying and what they're declaring. They're declaring that Jesus himself is the Messiah the Lord, the King of Israel, God himself. And to the Pharisees and any devout Jew, those songs of praise, and for someone like Jesus to receive those songs of praise would have been considered blasphemy. And so they tell Jesus to rebuke his disciples. But notice what Jesus doesn't do. He does not rebuke the disciples. And Jesus says those words, and he says... If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. You see, Jesus is saying, even if the disciples are quiet, all of creation rejoices with my arrival. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so what we're going to do is we're going to shift now to our fourth perspective, and that comes from John's gospel. And John's gospel was written by one of Jesus' closest disciples named John. In fact, John himself refers to himself as the, the, the disciple that Jesus loved. And so we're going to listen to John read for us John 12, verses 12 through 19. Isn't that beautiful how that worked out? It just worked out? So let's go ahead and read John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. The next day, the great crowd had come for the festival, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd 
that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Yeah. Thank you, John. Yeah. So now in John's gospel, we get a better picture of the people who are gathering. And we read those words, that great crowd coming for the festival. And the crowd was coming for the celebration of the Passover festival. And so we hear great crowd. Let me give you a perspective of what that might look like. So Josephus, who is a first century Jewish historian, he wrote this. On Passover, the population of Jerusalem swelled to more than 2 million as Jews made pilgrimages to the temple for the annual celebration. And so 2 million would have equated to about a 3 times Jerusalem's normal population during this one week. So I want you to imagine for a moment, let's say that we decided it would be a good idea if we did the AT&T Pro-Am Golf Tournament and we did it the same time as Car Week and we also did it the same time as Sea Otter Classic here in Monterey. Can you imagine what that would feel like, how crowded the roads would be, how crowded Monterey would be. It would be just complete, packed in, confusion, chaos. And that was Jerusalem in the first century. It was crowded. And that particular year, it was going to be especially crowded because the word was out. The word was out that Jesus was coming, the miracle worker the one that we've been watching and listening to, his teaching, his amazing teaching, and he's coming to Jerusalem. So we also know that there were people, there were men, there were women, there were the sick, there were the lame, the blind, those who were spiritually oppressed, those people who were suffering, and they were longing, they were longing just to get a glimpse of Jesus, to touch Jesus' cloak, to hear words spoken from Jesus, and maybe to be healed by Jesus. They all had come to Jerusalem, and along that road was their opportunity to see Jesus up close and personal. And we also know that there were Jewish political zealots. These were those people that that were praying for and waiting for the long-awaited time for the Messiah to return so that they could overthrow this Roman oppression. And so they would have been in their crowd that day. And there were even those, we read in John, the Pharisees, those religious leaders who despised Jesus and his teaching, who hated Jesus and his teaching. In fact, they had been plotting actively to kill Jesus. And we read right at the end in verse 19, it says, so the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look at how the whole world has gone after him. You see, what they're saying there is, it's time for us to take more drastic measures. This Jesus is dangerous. And so as you think back and you read those gospel accounts, can you see the many different perspectives of Jesus as he comes to Jerusalem? People of all ages and backgrounds, political zealots, religious leaders, maybe even the Romans themselves who professed that there was only one true king and his name was Caesar. So did they see Jesus as a threat? And all of this is swirling and moving towards a climax which would occur at the cross where Jesus would be crucified. So each group then had a unique perspective of Jesus, a unique perspective, and they had their own opinions And they certainly had their own expectations of him and what he had come to accomplish. And so contrary, though, to the opinions and expectations of the crowds that had gathered along the road and were gathering in Jerusalem, Jesus first came as the promised king. Jesus is, Jesus was, and Jesus always will be the promised king, the Messiah, the anointed one, anointed by God himself to save his people. And up to this point, Jesus, the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, it had been kept very close hold 
amongst the disciples and those closest to Jesus. But on Palm Sunday, what did Jesus do when he made the decision to get on the back of that donkey and fulfill prophecy? Jesus was doing this. He was saying, the Messiah has come and I am him. Jesus was publicly announcing his Messiahship, that he is the one that you have been waiting for all these years. Jesus Christ was and is and always will be the Messiah. And Jesus also came as the peacemaking king. Now Jesus rode in on the colt of a donkey. He didn't choose to ride in on a white stallion or on a war horse. Jesus chose to fulfill prophecy by riding in on the colt of a donkey. And that's significant because in that time of history, in ancient history, when two kings wanted to go to war against each other, they would meet in the middle of the battlefield and they would both ride the biggest, meanest war horses they could find. But if a king said to another king and they came to the middle and one of the kings chose to ride on the back of a humble creature like a donkey... The donkey was symbolic for peace. And so in that case, the king would be saying, I come in peace. And so Jesus comes to Jerusalem. He comes in peace. And he comes not followed by an army ready to impose the rule and to to overthrow the Roman Empire. Jesus doesn't come to impose God's rule and make war, does he? He comes to extend God's grace and make peace, to make peace with God. Because Jesus will move from this day to the end of the week. Jesus will offer himself as a perfect sacrifice for the sins of all mankind. Jesus will make, in that, offers a way for us to be at peace with the God who created us. The God who Our sin separates us from that relationship. And Jesus comes to make peace for each and every one who will receive his grace and believe in him. Jesus is the peacemaking king. And Jesus also, we know, not only does he make peace for us with God, Jesus also promises us, when we believe in him, the peace of God. The peace of God that Jesus talks about in John 14, 27. When Jesus says, peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. See, Jesus' point is that real, lasting, eternal peace only comes from Jesus. He is the source of the ultimate peace, which we all long for. And so Jesus is the peacemaking king. And lastly, Jesus came as the purposeful king. Jesus purposefully offers himself as the Messiah. He's fully aware that this will provoke the Jewish leaders to take action against him. It's not by accident that Jesus chooses to get onto the colt. It's not by accident that Jesus comes to Jerusalem and gets tricked and somehow goes to the cross. Jesus purposefully lives out the prophecy and purposefully offers himself as the sacrifice. And Jesus rode on that donkey. There was no turning back. His destination was the cross. And this was the action that was like lighting the fuse, which would erupt later that week with him being crucified. Now think about that. The same crowds who cheered and praised him on Palm Sunday by week's end would be screaming, crucify him, crucify him. He had arrived to Jerusalem, cheered, praised, and celebrated. And by week's end, he would be crucified. He would die a criminal's death, and he would be buried in the tomb. And we know what happens the rest of the story. But Jesus, alone, abandoned by those who praised him and welcomed him. So the question then is, why did he do it? 
Now, why didn't Jesus just keep riding through Jerusalem? Or why did he choose to do that? To offer himself. At any point, he could have turned back. But he faithfully and willfully and joyfully submitted to the Father's will. He did it out of love for the Father and love for each one of us. No matter where you are or where you've been, Jesus' actions on that day were for you because he loved you. He loves you and he has made a way for you if you will choose to receive his grace. And so as we look back on this four gospel accounts, I think we can see three primary lessons. We call these three lessons for us. One would be an eternal truth, and then how do we respond to that eternal truth? Well, the first is this. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Make no mistake, Jesus' actions, his words, everything he did on Palm Sunday affirm his lordship as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the creator and sustainer of the universe. Jesus is Lord. And so how do we respond then to that? Our response is to worship him, is to faithfully and joyfully submit to his lordship in every area of our life. And it's not through short-lived songs of praise and laying out cloaks and branches along the way that we worship Jesus. We offer ourselves every day as a living sacrifice, the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans 12, holy and pleasing to the Lord. It's a daily offering, submitting to his will, acknowledging his lordship. And we come together, it's beautiful when we get to come together and we get to worship him through songs of praise, whether we're here on campus or online. That's a beautiful, beautiful form of worship. But that can't be all of our worship of Jesus. Every day is an opportunity for us to worship him. And we also know the second point, the second lesson we learn is that Jesus doesn't always meet our expectations. It's almost hard to say that. Jesus doesn't always meet our expectations. For those in the crowd on that Palm Sunday and for us today, Jesus doesn't always meet our expectations. Well, what, what do you mean Jesus doesn't meet my expectations? Jesus doesn't want to meet my desires and my wants and my whims. That's what Jesus is supposed to do, right? And the answer is no, we know that. We know that our expectations are oftentimes our own, our own plans, our own desires. And so we say, well, why doesn't Jesus meet them? We go back to lesson number one. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, and we're not. Jesus is sovereign, and we're not. And Jesus certainly knows what is ultimately best for us. And we do not. Jesus is Lord. But oftentimes it means our expectations aren't met the way that Jesus, that aren't met the way we would want. But Jesus has different plans, doesn't he? Plans like I had in June of 2010, I was living what I call the dream assignment. I was, at the time, a professor of military science in North Dakota State University up in Fargo, North Dakota. Yes, that is a dream assignment for some of us. And so I'm on this dream assignment, and I go off to summer training. And while I'm at summer training, I get an email, and the email is addressed from the Secretary of Defense. And the email says this, congratulations, you have been selected for assignment to NATO training mission Afghanistan. Your report date is July 1st. It was June 14th. I had two weeks. And so in that moment, I'm thinking to myself, but Jesus, this is not what I expected. This assignment was going to set me up for retirement. I was going to stay in this assignment, and I was going to wrap up my military career. What a great plan I had in place. But Jesus had other plans. And so I got in my car and I drove back and as I'm driving back, you know, just like many of you have maybe experienced in your life when the expectations that you have that somewhere Jesus brings along some other plans for us 
And so I'm going through every range of emotion you can go through. I'm crying, I'm angry, I'm questioning, I'm frustrated. And I'm, I'm sure I was just a mess as people are driving past, like looking over at me as I'm driving, going, what in the world's going on there? But I got about halfway through Wisconsin. And in that moment, there was a still small voice. I remember it today. The words were this, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And so I got home and went off to Afghanistan on what I thought was supposed to be a six, but it turned into a nine, to a 12, to a 15-month deployment in Afghanistan. But in that season I was in, the Lord presented for me some amazing opportunities. First, for spiritual growth. Because I was deployed for that extended period of time, I found myself just diving into God's word, thirsty to learn more, to apply it to my life, to answer those questions I had. I was praying with more passion for myself, my family, and for my soldiers. And I was worshiping Jesus at an all-new level, knowing that worship isn't about a building. I could be in Afghanistan, Kabul, Afghanistan, wherever, and I could worship Jesus. Jesus gave me those opportunities to grow spiritually. But also, I had opportunities for my career to grow. While I was in Afghanistan during that season, I got promoted. And when I got promoted, they gave me an option. You get to go to some advanced schooling. You get to go get an advanced degree. And so I had a boss at the time who was a graduate, an alumni of this little place called Naval Postgraduate School. <laughs> and so my boss says to me, he says, hey, You've been selected to promote, get promoted and you get to do this advanced schooling. Have you ever thought about going to Naval Postgraduate School? It's a great, great place for you to go and grow. And I said, no, I've never heard of it. He says, I'll tell you what, I'll write you a letter of recommendation and I'll get these two admirals to write letters as well. And guess what happened, church? I got selected to come. So in June of 2012, two years after that assignment, two years, my wife and I came to Monterey and we walked on the Shoreline campus. And 10 years later, I'm standing up here preaching a message. If left to my own expectations, I would have never chosen that route. But Jesus knew what was best for me ultimately. And so in those moments, Jesus doesn't live up to our expectations. We're called to trust him. And I don't know and I can't imagine where you're at right now in your life. But just know this. Just as Jesus did on Palm Sunday, he had a plan and a purpose. We can look back and see his plan and purpose fulfilled at the cross and the empty tomb. We can trust him today knowing that he has a plan and a purpose and our last lesson is this, that Jesus meets our deepest needs. Our deepest need ultimately is to be in the right relationship with our creator God. And Jesus alone makes that relationship possible because the sin that we all bear is what separates us from that relationship with God. And Jesus reconciles that by taking our sin and took our sin on the cross so that we could be in right relationship with God when we receive his grace and believe in him. And Jesus also meets our deepest needs, things like joy and hope and peace and protection and security and purpose among many, many other qualities. Jesus meets those deepest needs. And so our response then is to follow him. It's to follow him. Jesus will meet those deepest needs. And so as we think about following him in our life, what does that look like? What does that look like in our life today? How are we following him? Because when Jesus came to his disciples and Jesus did not give them a five-step plan and which would be the best course of action for your life, Jesus gave them a simple two-word invitation. He said, follow me. And he extends that same invitation to each of us today. And so then on this Palm Sunday, 2022, what's our response? What's our response to Jesus? Will we worship him with a fresh perspective on who he is and what he's done for us? 
Will we trust him with a renewed confidence and who he is and his good plan for us? And then ultimately, will we follow him with a revived sense of purpose and commitment, knowing that he is leading us to the ultimate good for our lives? So Lord Jesus, that's our prayer today, that we would worship you an ever-increasing measure, that even this week, Lord, as we prepare for Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, Lord, that we would, that we would pause, we'd look at our lives, and that we would worship you, not just with songs of praise, which are beautiful, but with our entire lives. And Lord Jesus, may we also trust you May we trust you no matter what season we are in right now, what we are going through, we can look back in the Gospels and we see Palm Sunday and we trust you knowing the outcome of your actions and what you offer to us by extending your grace. And then, Lord Jesus, we pray especially that we would follow you no matter what, what we might be dealing with that we would just follow you, our love for you, and that as we follow you, Lord, that you would open up new opportunities for us as well. And perhaps today, Lord, whether online or here in the worship center or on campus, there's someone that doesn't yet know you, Jesus. They have not yet chosen to follow you. Jesus, I pray, we pray as one church that this week, Jesus, would you speak to those people, those who don't yet know you, that you would draw them close to you. And as they experience the power of what you did for them on the cross and the power and majesty of your resurrection, Jesus, that they too would acknowledge that you are Lord. And Jesus, we pray this all in the power and the majesty of your name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you all. Before I send you out with a word of blessing, we are so excited that this Friday and Sunday, we have the opportunity to come back together to worship. And so I want to encourage you all, you'll see the Easter service times are up on the screen there, the Good Friday. And so we want to encourage you to come back on Good Friday and also on Easter Sunday. Now, just as a word of encouragement, especially, we've added an extra service on Easter Sunday, and that service is going to be at 8 a.m. And as Pastor Kevin said last week, we want to really encourage those of you who've got young children to try to make it to that service, because there's going to be a special gift for the kids to come at the 8 a.m. service, Amen. So again, if you want, the service times are on our website, but also we do have out in the, the lobby, you can see we've got these invite cards. I want to encourage you to take one for yourself so you remember the times, but also take two more or three more or as many more so that you can hand them out and get them out to other people in your life so that they can also come and experience the goodness, the love of Jesus Christ. And we also want to offer this morning, as we always do every Sunday, the opportunity to be prayed for. So if you're online today, you can go ahead and uh, call that number that's on the screen. Somebody is standing by. They'd love to pray for you. And then here in the worship center on campus, our prayer teams are up front, and they'd love to pray with you. Whether it's a great joy in your life or maybe it's a real difficult season you're in, they'd love to pray with you. And for those of you who are new today, a special welcome to you. We're so thankful you came. So if, you want, if you're on campus, go by the Connection Center. Just let them know you're new. They've got a special gift to welcome you today. And for those of you who are watching online, you can just text the word welcome, and they will send you a digital connection card. So and those of you who are here on campus, if you would, even on home, if you would uh, go ahead and please feel free to stand if you're able and receive the blessing. So as we go from this place, go in the grace and the peace and the power of the one who loves you, the one who on that Palm Sunday made the necessary steps so that we could enjoy the freedom that he alone offers. Amen? Go in his peace and in his power. Amen.